Well, good morning, ladies, gentlemen, excellencies. My name is Tech Hiz, and I'm the director for travel and tourism at the, AV, um, at the World Economic Forum. Um, this is a pleasure to have you here and um, welcome you to this session. The session actually follows through a very long debate we had um, the day before yesterday in a high-level meeting with the ministers and the private sector. So I will not take too much time, but needless to say, um, this work and the work and the, and the conclusions that we've come to are part of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on New Models for Travel and Tourism. So with that, I'll pass it on to our moderator, Jeffrey, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning and welcome ladies and gentlemen, to what we would like to be a very interactive discussion today between you and our panel here. We have what might be called one of the hot topics of the country and of the region, and that is uh, basically travel and tourism as a, as a driver of a sustainable future. And we have an excellent panel with us today. Um, we have, I'll just go from my left, I'm not going to make uh, bio, bio introductions. You have programs. Tony Fernandez, you know, who is the, um, the brilliant founder of AirAsia. And, a, and if you don't know that he's the founder of AirAsia, he'll be putting his hat on in a minute <laughs> to let you know. And, and a host of other related industries, including um, Queen's Park Rangers Football Club, which is his passion. Uh, Minister Marie Pangestu, who is the Minister of Tourism and Creative Industries for the Republic of Indonesia, and is well known um, as a speaker for this region and for her country in the international arena. Our host, Minister U Te Hong Ong, who is the Minister of Hotels and Tourism for Myanmar, and we were talking before, who has for the, certainly the last, the last year, year and a half, been quietly going around international meetings in order to position his country and his vision and the country's vision as a, tourism, as a tourism player of a different kind than it has been in its, in its recent history. Um, Minister Jimenez from the Republic of the Philippines, um, who was telling us before that he's relatively new to the ministerial world. He perfectly epitomizes the forum because he's had a career in business. And last but not least, to ensure that we have a critical dimension in our thinking here is Sebastian Marot, who's the executive director of Friends International, which is one of these incredible NGOs which is doing serially good things in respect of children and education throughout this region and increasingly around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a great panel. The last thing you want is, is a long speech from a moderator. So I'll make two or three points. We are here to talk about the region, but clearly we're here at a critical moment and a wonderfully, wonderful moment in the, in the evolution of our host country because it's a, a real example of a country with a chance to move rapidly from the backwaters to the mainstream of international affairs in the middle of one of the most dynamic regions. You've heard this said so many times, but from a tourism dimension in the middle of a region which has 500 million um, anxious potential visitors to your beautiful country, Minister. And this transformation is coming at a time when the world is moving in this direction to become Orient-centric, when the BRICS countries are starting to become the leaders of our world, and when everything is hyper-connected, the good things and the bad things. 
And we are all here, I think, because we support this progressive transformation. Um, we're all here because we understand that travel and tourism is a huge industry, 5 to 10 percent of GDP for, and jobs and trade. And here is a country where, where it's a much smaller percentage, Minister, I'll leave that to you, but has a potential to move to those levels with all of the transformational benefits that that can do to, in terms of education, bringing a country into a world nation building, it's a huge opportunity. And it's got a key challenge. How do you balance the good against the potential bad? There's a massive impact in terms of sheer numbers, infrastructure, carbon footprint, resource consumption, things that it's easy to say, but if you don't get at them at the right time, which can drag you back in terrible ways. How do you do this in a coherent, measured way? We seem to have all the numbers on the growth side. We don't seem to have the numbers on the green side. We don't always put them together. And last but not least, how do you do that while you safeguard the authenticity and the beauty of a country like this and a region like this where the key is the culture, the history, and the people? So that's the nature of the debate. And without any more to do, I will introduce the minister from Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jaffrey. And also, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all of the audience here for joining with us. Firstly, uh, I would like to talk to Mr. Jaffrey because, you know, on the 5th, when we started the travel and tourism high-level meeting, especially in the last section, he named me, I am the master chef of this program, and he gave me the guiding principle for sustainable tourism development in Myanmar. So this guidance cover not only the public sector, but also the private sector, which is very, very useful for the sustainable development of Myanmar. But I don't think he is a pearl mystery or, you know, a predictor or something like that. But his prediction became very true in a very short moment because Last night, our president hosted the dinner. I am all, I was already occupied only in the kitchen with the staff. <laughs> because, you know, one side is the most, you know, uh, we, we have three categories. One is the head table. Second is the VIP, just like the ministry level and high, you know, uh, <clears throat> investors, something like that. And then the rest, all the rest of the participants. So we have to serve on table on time. Then we <clears throat> delegate uh, our staff to take care of the buffet. But, you know, when we start the program, uh, our staff, this is the first, what we call, experience uh, on such kind of the big dinner, especially in Nepido, especially in, I can say, Myanmar, because, you know, altogether 1,200 guests are sitting. So that's why his prediction is very true, and I was almost occupied in, 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 in the kitchen, <laughs> and when the dinner was finished, I had a dinner at 9.30 <laughs> with my staff. So, you are very true. <laughs> so, so, let me get to the point, huh? because the time is very limited. Today, you see the growth of Myanmar because of the openness, because of the transparency. So, that's why the world is curious about Myanmar. That's why I can say that the world is in Nepido. 
So we are very happy to see like that. We are very happy to welcome like that. We are very happy to receive such kind of uh, uh, participations in it. But, you know, the growth is not given a positive impact on tourism. You can see, you can also see the negative impact at the same time on the other side. This is the nature of tourism, which has a, a double swoosh impact. So that's why we have to be see double ash impact. So we have to be careful on that. So according to our figures, last year we received 1.06 million, which was a record in Myanmar tourism industry. Then we, we will be, uh, this year also, we, we have been uh, receiving with a growth of 40%. But we want to get more because, because of the nature of human being. We all are very greedy. So today we want to get more. So when they check our paper, the master plan, you know, our friends say, it is too ambitious. You have to be careful on the, on, on, on the negative impacts, something in terms of economics, in terms of social, in terms of environmental. Yes, I said, but I cannot avoid it. Because, you know, we all, uh, we all uh, wanted to welcome all the visitors uh, as much as we could. So this is, this is the, but my explanation is, Myanmar is not a small country. Myanmar is not a city state. Myanmar has the size of more than 600,000 square kilometer. So we can handle it. There are some countries in the region, like three million, four million, but we have only one million right now. So that's why we want to, to, to get more visitors to come over to Myanmar. We can also say, I have three million, I have five million, not only myself, but also the leaders. You know, the leaders want to say like that. So today, our, our, our discussion uh, with the private sector from the YGL, uh, with our president, you know, when they ask for tourism, he, al he is also very he happy to say that, to say like what we want to get more, not only the tourists, but also the investors. So this is the point that we have. For this purpose, we are in the age of infancy. I have seen not only the positive, but also the negative. So, simply speaking, we are not educated in tourism, not like the experts. So, but we need the living documents for the country. That's why the first thing is I did the responsible tourism policy, which has already published. And this is also, we get the guiding principles for the sustainable development of tourism. We intend to use tourism to make Myanmar people to get a better uh, life to live in. At the same time, we also want to enjoy our visitors, to see our way of life, to feel our warm welcome, uh, to enjoy our culture and na natural heritage, and to pay respect our people. This is what we want to do. So this is the mission of this responsible tourism policy. Then I would like to give the reality of our customs, our traditions, you know, because you know it's totally different. Yesterday, when the Vietnamese uh, guy wants to take a photo with me, and he, he say that he want to put his hand on my shoulder, uh, according to our custom, it is, it is a little bit rude, but I don't want to say anything. Okay, just <laughs> let it be. <laughs> so this is the nature. Eh? And also, you know, if, if you are... Uh, talking with other people in the room or just like a student. Students, you know, in, in other areas, they, they put the, 
legs on the chair or some people, they put the leg on the table. This is not the style of Myanmar. It is very rude. We, we always respect, respect to our teachers. So we never want to do like that. So this is the difference. But it is not, not, not the what we call bad things. You know, when you want to receive, you have to see like these natures. But we have to, we have to let them know about the traditions and customs and stuff. So when you are talking about homestay, so I said, we wait for a while. We are in the ASEAN. We have to be complying with our, our friends in the region. But we said, according to our traditions, we don't want to do like that. Yeah? But maybe in, uh, now we are doing, especially in the remote areas, for tracking, for tracking, for climbing, something like that in, in the very dense forest area. So at that, at that time, okay, we allowed them to stay at the local residence, something like that. This is a one thing. So that's why I did a do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts for international visitors to, to get you know, uh, our information in advance. Then I go to the community involvement in tourism. This is also the very useful for the people to understand. Not only the visitors, I have to, I have to educate and convince the, all the people, not the public, private, and the people in the community to understand about, Jeffrey said, good and bad. I said also the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You see, that's why it can be happen like that in, the, in our tourism industry. So I have already published all these you know, uh, papers and you know, distribute it to our state and division. There are 14 states and divisions in our country with different national races. They have to be aware of such kind of community, develop, community involvement in tourism. One day or uh, at present, now they are the decision maker. They have to feel the good and the bad if they make mistakes. So this is also very important. So I did it, I distributed it, I delivered it, and I am also explaining to them at the planning uh, commission for, for national planning meeting, something like that, with the, with the president, with the cabinet ministers, and all the chief ministers across the country. So when they came here, I, I, expl I explained to them about the book it is already finished. Then, with the assistance of the Norwegian government and ADB, the master plan will be coming up soon. The draft is already completed, but I said, just wait, of, wait for a while. I want to present this. This is not the launching. This is just to present to the people across the world to let them know about you know, what sectors we should be put in, what sectors we should be deleted, what important facts we have to be put it in. So that's why the professor came down uh, to Myanmar, then we already presented about uh, the master plan. So I got all, all the feedback from, from my friends. So I'm very thankful uh, to all of you for this support. So, Minister, if, if I'm sorry, huh? if, if I may, I don't want to stop you in full stride, but just if I can follow the, the logic of this, part of this is for your own people, part of this is for the visitors. You started with the responsibility part, you brought the community in, you brought the cabinet and your other ministers in, you then unveiled a strategic plan three days ago mm -hmm. when we came here you brought the international tourism community together to comment on this, and that's the stage where we are now. You, you've, you are a master chef. In fact, you have been cooking, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm cooking a sous chef, this, sous chef. this meal. You're a sous chef to the president, of course. You're a sous chef. But, but you've been cooking this meal for some time. And, and we'll come back to it, if I may, if, if that works for you, because I'd like to move to, um, to Minister Jimenez, and, and ask, as you look at the Philippines, which is a, a country in a totally different 
a different situation and a, and a different position. And you don't have the ability to have this blank page to start from, and nor do you have the ability to introduce things in a step-by-step -step measured way, as we've heard from the minister. How, how, are you going to, how are you dealing with this issue? Well, as you, you might imagine, like many countries in Asia, you begin with a general assumption that you understand almost instinctively what it is to be a host. And that is, if you will, where the Philippines kind of started. It began with, uh, if you will, a kind of a painful realization that successful hosting is not automatically successful tourism. And that, in fact, our point of view must begin with a fundamental strategy. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's the commitment that inclusiveness is not the end result, Jeffrey. It is the strategy. A successful tourism program begins by deciding whom to include, what communities have the highest propensity to succeed, and then you move forward. Because if you begin with inclusiveness, you will end with it. This was, believe it or not, a very difficult realization because for all our great hospitality, and it is legend, you know, uh, that's why we insist it's more fun in the Philippines. <laughs> we realized that fun must be a combination of the capability to transform that, as President Aquino said, into more than just counting Koreans coming out of an airplane. It must result very directly in the jobs that it will create for our people and the opportunities that that presents. At the same time, it must, in fact, very boldly and very loudly say that we are not going to destroy our country in the process of welcoming the world to it. And this is very difficult. This famous island called Boracay is now the focus of some tremendous relearning. And in fact, we are determined to uh, sustain it precisely because this is the place, at the same time that we are welcoming tourists, we are now building what we hope will be the world's most successful coral farm. We have found a way to regrow coral in the Philippines. And we are starting that in Boracay itself. So that tourism ceases to be a threat, but an opportunity for us to learn more and more. And uh, I, I believe I said in in uh, earlier discussions. Tourism is an iterative exercise. You learn as you go. It's like riding a bike. You can't learn to ride a bike by reading a book. You just do it and you learn. And uh, you keep your fingers crossed and hope, uh, as we do, that uh, the mistakes you make are not irreversible and that the, op the opportunities that you are able to seize are the ones that will uh, sustain you in the future. And maybe more about that later, but in the ASEAN context, it's exactly the same thing. Participation means everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Minister Pangestu. Um, both from the perspective of Indonesia and, and from the ASEAN perspective, you share the same view as Minister Jimenez? Yeah. I think at first I'd like to congratulate Minister Aung for, I think, a process that we would all envy uh, to be able to learn so much from others and start, uh, if you like, with a blank page and to have a huge learning experience, lessons learned uh, from other countries. And I think the most important lesson uh, is, again, similar to what uh, Minister from Philippines was saying, that how do you prioritize the tourism sector so that it's not just a tourism minister who's doing the cooking. Yeah. It, it has to be uh, that we are probably preparing the menu and, and doing the cooking, but it requires a lot of other ministries uh, and other stakeholders to be included, because otherwise it just doesn't work. You know? and, and I think that's the revolution or thinking that, you, that I have seen myself, uh, just even though I've only been Minister of Tourism for the last one and a half years, this kind of whole of government approach 
to tourism uh, has increasingly become the norm. And I think the turning point is when the United States of America came up with their national tourism action plan in May of last year. I mean, uh, for a country like the U.S., which never even had a tourism anything anywhere in, their, in the federal uh, government, uh, this was qu quite a revolution. And that shows you the importance of the tur tourism sector for the economy, for jobs, uh, and I think for, for the nation, as you, you said, nation building and nation branding. But it requires a whole of government approach because you need to have the airports, you need to have the training, you need to have the planes come in, you need to have the open skies policy, uh, and you need to have the you know sustainable environment, sustainable social and cultural aspects. So I, I think this is really uh, where we are, and a lot of us uh, in different countries uh, are in different stages of trying to, I think, basically as tourism ministers, uh, emphasize the importance of our sector uh, to uh, our leaders, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that President Aquino is really prioritizing it, and in Myanmar, our president is beginning to. We have actually a law that says that there should be a pre the president or the vice president should be uh, the head of this uh, coordination of national tourism, just like what you are uh, doing in your master plan. Uh, and I think this is something that will be coming, uh, becoming important. And that should translate in the way we do, so nationally, regionally, and globally. Uh, nationally, that's what's happening. What about regionally in ASEAN? Uh, I think in ASEAN, what's happening is that we as ASEAN uh, members, we're trying to promote ASEAN as a destination. So it's not just Indonesia or Myanmar or Philippines. How do we package uh, two or three uh, stops in one ASEAN? And you know, companies like low-cost low carriers like Air Asia helps us a lot to be able to do that uh, packaging. But that requires you to do what? You have to have uh, visa-free within ASEAN. Second, we want to have common ASEAN visa so that anybody coming in to Philippines can go to Indonesia without visa. Uh, so these are mobility of people. That's one aspect. Open skies, having the uh, airlines and the connectivity be able to happen. Uh, and then the infrastructure itself. And finally, uh, standards. Uh, that's another part of the uh, ASEAN cooperation where we, are, uh, we have introduced standards for hotels uh, and including uh, homestays, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so it goes from the five star to the, to the homestay. So this is about the inclusiveness and the, and the community building and the people who are working in this sector, the professionals, because by 2015, uh, with ASEAN Economic Community, you, you can have free movement of professionals in, in the hotel uh, and travel uh, tourism uh, hospitality sector. I think there's 32 categories of professions that can move. So you have to have standards and you have to have mutual recognition agreements and certification. And that, that hopefully will make us a more competitive uh, location. Thank you. I noticed that you twice recognized the importance of Tony. I don't know if he's given you one of his hats to wear after, <laughs> after the meeting. That's, <laughs> that's the picture of the conference, by the way. Uh, Tony, you've got really a terrific opening today. Everybody wants open skies and more visitors. Yeah, it's uh, music to my ears, to be honest. Um, firstly, if you don't recognize me, it's because I'm dressed up because there are three tourism ministers on my panel, of which all of the countries I fly to. So yesterday, I was wearing jeans and T-shirt, but the beauty of owning an airline is that I could send a message, and they sent me up trousers and a proper shirt. And I'm also being very well behaved. I'm not wearing my cap, ministers, so please support AirAsia. This, this is a first, by the way. It is a first. Um, I suppose I just want to touch on one point which hasn't been covered yet in terms of developing sustainable tourism is the branding aspect and how Myanmar is going to brand itself. And I was thrilled um, at the dinner uh, of watching the, uh, the whole presentation from the logo of uh, Myanmar to the video that was produced, which I, you know, I also am learning uh, a lot about the country and that one video uh, taught me a tremendous amount and drove me into saying I want to see more of this country. Uh, so, you know, we can have all the plans in the world, but we have to let people know 
uh, where to go, and what to do, etc. And um, a picture tells a million words. And so I think uh, a very important part in developing tourism in Myanmar is how you're going to tell the world about Myanmar and tell your own country about Myanmar as well, because everyone talks about tourism, they think about the inbound. Uh, but there's a, I always say you've got to be champions in your own country first. Uh, if you can develop a, a local tourism market of people from Bagan going to Yangon, uh, Yangon, then uh, you, start the, you start the whole infrastructure process. It's the domestic market that creates it, and the domestic market sets the tone of what the tourism market is. So I think in the blueprint, there must be a section for how to stimulate local tourism. Uh, you know, AirAsia, we, we, come, we started in a small country in Malaysia, and we've built a reasonable brand on the back of my cap. But we've also done things which have been different. You know, we sponsored Manchester United uh, when we only had seven planes. That was a very painful decision for me because I hate that football club um, <laughs> with a massive H. But you have to be a prostitute once in a while. And we, we went through huge pressures of building our brand. You know, we, we, tried, we wanted to sponsor the referees on the Premier League, which is a huge audience. And we were up against Emirates that had like a gazillion dollars more than us, uh, which goes to this man as well in front of me. And so I went to the Premier League and presented. And I said, look, you have to support us, not Emirates. There are probably about two people in Dubai watching football. While in Malaysia, we've been watching it all, all their lives, and that didn't make much difference. And then I said, you have to support us because all the bookies are in Malaysia fixing your games. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of woke them up. But finally, in terms of pushing the brand, I said, I want to sponsor the red card. And they said, what do you mean you want to sponsor the red card? I, I said, I want to have Air Asia on the red card because whenever a player is sent off, you know, you see the picture there. And it would be great to see Air Asia. On the other side, it says, now you're suspended, have a holiday with Air Asia. <laughs> but the, the theme of what I'm saying is that I think Miyama has a wonderful product. But there's, um, it's, it's good to have the product, but you've got to let the world know about the product and in your own country. And finally, there are lots of people who are letting the world know about their product as well. So to make yourself well heard is important. So I think in any sustainable uh, blueprint, the whole marketing of it needs to be there. I think Myanmar can benefit from, I think tourism has grown dramatically in ASEAN uh, recently, and you know, I'm thrilled of what's happening in the Philippines, because I think that also it's probably a little bit behind the other ASEAN countries, but now catching up because there's so much to see. But I think the beauty of ASEAN is that within four hours, there is such diversity. And I think if you, you know, four hours of America, with all due respect to Americans, is more or less the same. And uh, four hours uh, in Europe, though there are differences, is not as different as ASEAN. The, the, the whole the depth of it is massive. And I think Myanmar can piggyback on the back of 10 amazing countries and, of course, go around Asia only on AirAsia. <laughs> and at that point, I shall end my talk. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. As always, difference. Are you going to be showing the Myanmar video on AirAsia flights? Well, as a low-cost airline, we have no in-flight video. Uh, <laughs> But in September, we're introducing Wi-Fi, and you'll be able to stream content, and we will definitely will. We took the do's and don'ts. You know, a lady came and presented to me, and it was fantastic. It was a, it was a cartoon book on the do's and don'ts. And that, I think, is something we'll incorporate in our magazine straight away. But we'll extend it not just to Myanmar, to you know, all the parts of uh, ASEAN. We don't need to in Philippines, because it's always fun. <laughs> Everything is due, uh, as the minister said. Can I just add two more points, actually, while I remember? Uh, I think it's You're very important. You're going to do it whether I say yes yeah, or no, aren't you? Just, I think it's very important for tourists, payment mechanisms. And I hope in the, in the blueprint, because obviously people now don't carry as much cash and credit cards and debit cards, etc. So I think ease of tourism, uh, making it easy for tourists to, to transact. And finally, costs. 
I mean, I think I was unfortunately sitting next to two super luxury people in my tourism panel who wanted to tax everybody. I think it's very important that the mass market and the future leaders, the YGLs, etc., cetera, um, all don't start off with millions of dollars. And it's important to allow the young people to come here because they will be the future leaders as well. And so it's important not to tax the industry uh, too much. It's the easiest thing to tax. Airport tax, carbon taxes, you know, and the guy from Super Luxury Hotel wanted to tax everything. Uh, so I think it's... Uh, have you got a complex? Um, <laughs> I know you did, to be fair on you. But um, I think cost is important and to build a, a product that's affordable so the people of Myanmar can use it and the people of ASEAN can use it and then, and then later on. Thank you very much. Sebastian, you've been sitting there quietly listening to this. Um, what's your take on it as someone who's perhaps looking at tourism through a different set of spectacles? Yes, well, first of all, after Tony's introduction, I realized I lost all my chances of being taken seriously. I'm wearing jeans, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, let me try to tell you where I'm coming from. Um, I'm running an organization for marginalized urban children and youth, and in a very s small nutshell, we're doing two things. We're saving lives and we're building futures. So saving lives, we go uh, under the bridges, in the prisons, in the drugs den, in the squats where the kids are, and we provide life-saving services. And then building futures, it's all about helping little kids to go back to school and stay in school for as long as possible, for the young ones to get training so they can get employment and for, to rebuild families so the families can take care of themselves. Now, this relates directly in tourism because I work in Laos, in Thailand, in Indonesia, in the uh, Philippines, indirectly, in Myanmar indirectly. Um, and all these countries have seen a huge influx of tourists and, and quite rapidly. And uh, for me, it's, it's been very useful because on one hand, I see the benefit of it. In terms of building futures, it's absolutely great because I can do all these trainings for young people that will then be employed in the tourist industry. So we're running vocational training restaurants that are top of the travel advisory if you want to check. And, and that's high quality so they get the best jobs possible. Banking a lot on the tourism. But the saving lives part is where I'm more concerned. Um, really, if we need to look at, at the different types of tourists, there are, to me, three main types. The first ones are the predators, the ones that come in the countries just to take advantage, uh, sex tourists and especially the pedophiles. Um, everyone knows about this. When, when we say the risk of tourism, that's the first thing that comes to your head because the media has been extremely strong. It's very important, we work on it, many people work on it, but fortunately it's only a small percentage of the tourist population coming. The biggest one are the very nice tourists that want to just enjoy the country and contribute when they see some problems. And that is an issue because many of the tourists that come in a country actually don't know what to do and they see poverty, they see difficult situations and what do they do? So they, they react by instinct. They give money to the kids. They give food, um, which, by the way, keeps the kids on the streets. Because then I come later and say, can you come to the school? And I say, no, I made $5. Thank you very much. So it, it destroys the work of the future. Um, it also these people that take the kids in their hotel rooms because they pity them and give them showers, putting the kid at risk and themselves at risk because they could be arrested for that. So th there's a lot of very strange behaviors that we need to explain, we need to change. And then there's a third group that is now trendy. It's the, the charity tourists, the guys who are going and find it very interesting and très cool to go into an orphanage, take photos of the kids, play for a while, uh, put this on their, on their Facebook and feel extremely good, but they have done tremendous damage. They entered a, a private place where the kids should be safe. They, they, they came with a foreign... Uh, culture, they, it's really damaging and extremely dangerous. And all this has to be taken into account. So how to do that? Well, we run a project called ChildSafe. And ChildSafe is targeting different levels. We're targeting the tourists themselves in 
destination and arrival places to teach them about the good things to do, what not to do and what to do instead. So it's a positive approach trying to, to give alternatives to negative. And we run big campaigns, for example, a big campaign that's called Children Are Not Tourist Attractions to reduce this kind of trend of taking photos of the kids. Um, we work with the business, the, the, um, the tourism business. We work with the hotels. We work with travel agencies. We work with uh, airlines. I'm looking at Tony. To bring out the message, to train the professionals of the sector to know what's right and not right, how to protect the vulnerable populations when they take the tourists with them, and through that, teach also the tourists of the right things to do. And then uh, we work with, of course, the the wider communities because they need to be prepared to react when there's something and give them the tools to recognize what's right, what's wrong, how to react when something is, is going bad. So it has to be action oriented. It's not just papers that say these are the principles, but how do we do this and what are the tools? So it's a network of organizations, hotlines, etc. So when I see this rapid increase of tourism coming to Myanmar, I'm very excited job opportunities coming, we can train young people, there's huge potential. And then I panic because we're entering, these, these tourists are entering houses of people that are absolutely not ready, not trained, and unprepared to have this influx. And I think that's what you said. And so how do we build the safety nets to ensure that the people remain safe? And that's a thing that has to be done together, government, uh, NGOs, the private sector, uh, everyone, the communities, everyone needs to be part of this effort. And you see that coming at the beginning of the process rather than sporadically during the process or even when it's too late. Is that your message? Our message is we're in a very good position in Myanmar because we can start now and start to build that, build both the, the benefit but also preventing the damage. In other countries you don't have a choice. You have to to go along and try to minimize what's already been done and, and catch up. But it's feasible because if everyone gets on board, I see tremendous changes. I mean, our campaign on, on uh, children and not tourist attractions have raised in incredible responses. I thought I would be attacked by everyone. Actually, no, it's, it's, it created a, a movement in Cambodia and in, in Laos that's been quite amazing, actually. <coughs> so very, very positive support. Marie, if I may come back to you for one second. Um, you mentioned briefly in passing the visa situation, and we know the WEF has done, and other organizations, um, WTTC, IATA, WTO, have done terrific pata, have done terrific work in this field, in, in kind of getting to the stage where you were able to present here um, between a number of ministries and you ministers here, would you just like to say how important the visa issue is in this whole game? Yeah, I think uh, we, after you know, a long process of discussion and learning from countries' experiences, uh, I think we've concluded that obviously uh, having travel f being facilitated, people-to-people -people movement, can have a lot of impact on the number of uh, tourists coming into your country. I think the estimates range anything from 10 to 20 percent increase. If you could do uh, a lot of effort to reduce or remove uh, the restrictions uh, on, on visas without uh, sacrificing the security concerns of, of, of which why visas are uh, imposed. And in the case of ASEAN, uh, uh, three, four of us, uh, yes, two days ago, we uh, signed a letter of intent uh, towards smart tourism, uh, which we, we would like to uh, increase the efficiency in the first place of visa issuance by using technology, whether it's you know, electronic visa, e-visa, and uh, getting third parties to help you with the payment of the visa if you, if you did, uh, in fact, still have visas. Uh, so that you know it could be in your airline ticket, uh, et cetera. That that's kind of the first stage, uh, and uh, what and we will the four, at least the four min ministers from ASEAN, we would like to support a continued effort towards uh, first of all uh, travel within ASEAN, uh, visa-free uh, travel for ASEAN nation nationals within ASEAN, uh, and, come, and Myanmar because they are going to be the chair of ASEAN next year, I think has. Um, 
may I say it, <laughs> has made a commitment that by the end of this year, uh, all ASEAN nationals can travel visa-free uh, to Myanmar. So that, that's, then it's completed. <laughs> the, the, wow. the ASEAN visa-free travel is completed. Then our next target is the common visa uh, where non-ASEAN nationals can come in from any of the uh, ASEAN countries and then travel within ASEAN visa-free. Uh, that, that's kind of uh, the way we are moving forward, and uh, we will probably start with a f uh, you know, s few groups of countries, not all of ASEAN immediately, but a few groups of ASEAN countries within that to start doing the, the so-called common visa. Tony, before I turn this to the floor, and it is time to take it to the floor, this initiative on getting rid of... Um, too many formalities. We're not going to get rid of all formalities, but too many and burdensome formalities at the borders. Is this something that your colleagues in the aviation industry are firmly behind? Is there more need for transport ministers and tourism ministers and immigration ministers to sit down and get a common cause on this? I mean, the best thing I heard today was, you know, what uh, Minister from Indonesia, Mari, said was... Um, getting all ministries involved. Of course, we want less formalities. I mean, if you look at an Australian situation where, and we've been, we've been pushing various governments into this, where they still require visas, it can be done online. So at least 90% can get their visas very easily, and maybe you know, people they're not so sure about have to go in for an interview, etc. So I think we're at a position where we can use technology to make it better. Of course, we would like to get rid of visas all over the place, but there are some needs for it in some countries and some situations. But let's use technology as much as possible to keep it simple and, and make it easy. And just on that point, in terms of a smart system, I hope tourism uh, transport ministers also look at a common aviation policy. All these, you know, flying from here to Myanmar, we go through three different air traffic controllers who have three different standards and three different cost structures. Um, it'd be great for ASEAN to have a common aviation policy, a common air traffic control system, a common aviation authority like in Europe where they have JAR and the European um, air traffic control system. So whatever ASEAN can do to make it easy, not just in the visa form, but in all other modes, I think we would encourage tourism within ASEAN. Yeah. Just based on my own experience, the more one can get cross-ministerial discussion on this issue, particularly now that you have such a strong position on, from tourism ministers, which is so good for national development. The other point, however, what worries me in this, and, and you may, Minister Jimenez, you, uh, you may want to comment on this, the airports themselves need to be made more efficient as the visa system. It's, it's Difficult to make a visa system open, but if you have an airport where the people are then packed in, dealt with like sheep, it creates a terrible impression for people who've been sitting on airplanes for long periods of time. And, and I think that the, the ASEAN ministers might want to even look to make sure that that facilitation goes hand in hand. Yes, absolutely. I, I think... Uh, uh, especially in the case of the Philippines, there is a very serious uh, effort now to uh, reform the airport uh, management system and, in fact, to arrive at, shall we say, new standards and new paradigms, even relative to existing standards. What do I mean? Um, the new orientation is a stronger focus on passenger comfort. This notion of giant glass and steel airports is a paradigm that, uh, in our view, is about to shift because the focus must be on facilitation, reducing the time that people have to spend being processed in, in an airport. In, in other words, reducing the time from, shall we say, tube to curbside and uh, bringing that to the barest minimum. As with the uh, visa facilitation, the solution apparently is really just plain and simple technology and the sharing of data that actually allows us, for example, as they do uh, in other markets in the world, to uh, reduce, if not totally eliminate, departure protocols 
for immigration. That is a result of data sharing, as uh, Minister Murray pointed out. We are looking at that, and in fact, there is already an ASEAN uh, kind of initiative in that area because the ability to share data is the key to all of these uh, yes. things. I'm going to open this up now to questions from the audience, gentlemen in the second row. Do we have a microphone? And would you tell us who you are as well? Yes, uh, my name is Jack Sim. I'm the founder of the World Toilet Organization. <laughs> the other yes. WTO. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the World Tourism Organization. So there are three of us. Um, I, I just want to add on to the comfort factor that if you have better toilets, you will have more tourists. And this is a very neglected area because a lot of toilets are actually very disgusting. And when the tourists go there, they call back and they tell their friends, don't go to that place. Yeah. Especially when you are just newly developed, and also that they are going to bring aged uh, elders and children. So I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to say that uh, on the 2nd to 4th of October, um, Indonesia is hosting the World Toilet Summit, and the theme is about tourism toilets, and we'd like everybody to come. And of course, uh, Tony is also supporting us on this. Thank you very much. Well, this wasn't the question we were expecting. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there's another question. Please. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Annie Cole, Singapore Management University. I was very delighted with the conversation. I love the idea um, that the young should be part of this conversation. So I'm just wondering, how actively are you engaging universities as well as um, the next gen in terms of crossing the borders, having cheaper air flights, maybe, Tony, you'd like to do that as an entrepreneurship. I love the concept of standards, and I think what's missing is uh, the education piece. How are we involving the universities, the polytechnics in this conversation? Thank you. Who would like to answer that? As, <clears throat> as Mimar started the journey began, we are very aware of the human resource development. Now, <clears throat> we set up the university level, especially the bachelor degree, for the students to get learning at the Yangon and Mandalay University. We also have some small training schools in Mandalay and Yangon. Then also, I allowed private <clears throat> organizations to set up the tuitions or small training or something like that. So now we warmly welcome all of the international institutions to come over to check the situation and to get the business not only with the public but also the private sector. We have already opened. Yeah, under the ASEAN agreement, obviously there are what we call competency standards for different professional qualifications in the hospitality industry. So that will help to, I guess, standardize the curriculum. Uh, and then we probably should work towards, you know, more and more uh, competency standards. And, and that's hopefully, certainly we involve all the universities uh, and uh, institutes uh, in uh, teaching tourism. But I think what needs to be, we need to be more forward looking and think about the sustainability standards. I think that's the one that's still not there. Uh, and, and certainly in, in, a, in my country where we have a lot of uh, tourism destinations which, are, uh, which, which have very important uh, issues of sustainability, it goes from you know, having dive operators who are well trained all the way to uh, how do you manage a destination so it's sustainable. I think that's where we would love to work with universities. Let, let me, uh, uh, just Tony, quickly, please. just on, on the first point, obviously uh, low-cost carriers have been a big driver in getting people to move around. And I think there's nothing like learning until you go to, go to the country itself. And I think the youth is driving ASEAN integration much quicker than any politician or corporate figure because they're beginning to understand each other much more. If you, if you look at an AirAsia plane, the majority is young people who are flying to places they never thought about flying to. 
uh, from our uh, point, uh, we are facilitating uh, teachers and young people to exchange. Uh, we're creating an exchange. So uh, recently, there were five uh, teachers from Bali who came to dive schools in uh, Malaysia to educate the process. So we're uh, having an exchange because the best way of, of getting tourism product to be understood and to share experiences is for those experiences to go into the country. So we support those means. But I think certainly low-cost carriers have made ASEAN a smaller place, and I think the integration process is in a healthy place because of the young. Let me just, if I may, before going to Simon Cooper, let me just make one general comment. Um, I've spent a long time in this sector in the public side with the World Tourism Organization, in the private side with the World Travel and Tourism Council, and with the airlines, with the IATA. I think this area, because we've been so fragmented, we've missed something very significant on the link with education. Most of the education has been vocational. Tourism as a, as a discipline has actually only recently started to come into university curricula. Around the world, it's mostly a subset of geography or economics. Yes. And I think as the industry's matured over the last 20 years, and now it is being recognized by the G20 and by other organizations, ASEAN, the EU is beginning to show some slow signs of waking up. This is the moment when your point is particularly valid. And I just want to mention, we have an initiative that I've been involved in that doesn't come out of the tourism side, it comes out of the environment side, with Maurice Strong, the father of, of sustainable development, has a concept of a world environment university. The one doesn't exist at the moment. And we are looking, including with Gerald's Academy in, in Dubai, we're looking at linking universities into that just for the travel and tourism side. And I think in the next two or three years, we've got about 20 in our network now, and in the next two or three years, you're going to see quite some focus on this from the institutional side of the sector. Um, Simon Cooper. Uh, Simon Cooper, Merit International. Uh, my question is uh, for the minister, our host. Uh, I did a little, you know, when you talk about countries ramping up tourism exponentially, which is what you are planning to do, my little list of countries that have successfully done it have all managed to work around the bottlenecks. They had bottlenecks and they created new destinations. I went through Mexico, Cuba, uh, Europeans and Canadians can fly to 12 airports in Cuba. They never have to go through Havana. Bali, Phuket, uh, Da Nang, Sri Lanka has built a new airport down the south. Common element is beaches and sun and sand. You can add Egypt to that list and Turkey. Uh, two airports that I picked up with Siem Reap and Ching Chiang Mai in terms of airports that are not beach related. Given that and the growth that you're looking for, clearly Rang uh, Yangon is a bottleneck. If we fast forward five years and your numbers are much larger, where are the tourists coming in to? What are the new destinations with the new airports that Tony's airplanes are going to be sitting on the ramp and being very busy with a Queen's Park Ranger logo on the side? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simon from Marriott. Uh, you came to Myanmar a long time ago, right? Now I'm very happy to see you again. So you see, just we did a <clears throat> nation branding campaign with su the support of image to blow Macy. So when I, I believe that the, the peoples will be coming. So for instance, just like a Nepiro airport, international airport, it will be open soon for the international airlines. Say in September, October, Air Asia will be coming to Nepiro. Nepiro is, is Nebido can be done for mice market. You know, we don't have many historical attractions, something like that, but we have the, the mice facilities here. We have um, 
capacity of the uh, sufficient capacity of the hotels here also. This one can be also done for the new market segment. Then also we have some other airports like Manly <clears throat> International Airport we also have. It was built since 2000, but unfortunately it was idle for many years. From Manly, you can go to other areas. This is like, this is like a hub for the country. So from there you can also get go to other areas, like go to the north uh, for the, for the um, mountain climbing or something like that. Then you can also go to the south. In the south, we have a good airport, but it is not enough for the jumbo jet or something like that. But it can be accessible to go there. So these are the opportunities for the country to improve the tourism. Other questions? Please. Hi, I'm Masato Takamatsu with the Japan Tourism Marketing Company. And my question is about the secondary or ground transportation. There were a lot of discussion about the importance of having a, a new accommodation or uh, airline access to the airport. But how can the visitors reach to the destination without the uh, uh, well-organized ground transportation, uh, transportation, especially in the time where there are more and more uh, travelers uh, traveling as an individual, not on an escorted tour. So the importance of secondary uh, transportation on the ground is much, much more uh, uh, thought about, should be thought about, and uh, do you have any plans to upgrade your secondary or ground transportation in Myanmar. Oh, of course, you have ones in the Philippines and Malaysia, but maybe there are more to, uh, room to improve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> ground transportation is, for the time being, it is handling by tour operators and travel agents. We don't have the special car rental services. Uh, in Myanmar for the time being. We have some car rental services, but it is only available for highways, highway buses or something like that. But in the near future, you know, there will be big car company, you know, they will be coming like that. But right now, the, the uh, local investor, they all are also interested in doing such kind of ground handling uh, business, not only in Yangon, but also in Nebido and other destinations. But it will be coming. We, we, we are in the issue of infancy. It is very difficult to stimulate. Now they see the market. So now the, there are about 1,100 visitors coming for this forum. So it is handled by one of the, the to, uh, tourism company, by Tourism Enterprise. So it is difficult to find. Uh, now we are talking about the standards also, not on, only the car. Ta, the car, in the past, it is very difficult to get import. La, import license is very expensive, incredible, incredible Myanmar in terms of prices. So that's why now today it is already relaxed. So there are many new cars in Yangon. You see also the traffic is jamming. But, so, uh, there will be more opportunities coming when the market is growing. Huh? Thank you. Okay, I'm told that we have five minutes left. I'm going to take one question. I'm then going to give one fast question. Sorry about that. I, I'm then going to give each panelist one minute to, can't do one minute, 30 seconds to last comment. Okay, thank you. My name is Sugianta. I'm from Indonesia. Uh, private sector. I'm our company making an uh, informal solution, especially uh, toward the plastic problem. I'm delighted to be here, seeing you know, hearing the three ministry talking about you know tourism and Sebastian touching on the negative effect tourism on the uh, the people. I'd like to bring forward you know how about the negative effect on the environment. I understand uh, like Indonesia, we have the environmental act four years ago. Singapore about 30 years ago. I'm glad to learn that Myanmar. 
a year ago, they have environmental act as well. And me, myself, going for tourism in, in various Asian and go to the beach and, you know, the plastic have, issue. The have 30 seconds for the okay. question. I'd just like to, to know whether this is uh, the green tourism. Is something on the agenda, you know, uh, in each country f uh, for the three ministries as well as whether the, the Asian collectively any policy toward that. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, would you like to quick answer on this one? In, in the Philippines, very much so. Uh, the uh, green tourism is in fact, or eco-tourism is a very strong area of focus. We believe that uh, the 7,107 islands of the Philippines are uh, worth preserving, each and every one. And uh, the uh, land use plans for each of our islands are already uh, nearing completion. Uh, once upon a time there was no such thing, by the way. And uh, this is all in pursuit of a stronger move to preserve the ecology. The Philippines being, uh, if you will, the center of the center of biodiversity in our part of the world. So we have an awesome responsibility in that respect, uh, being, uh, if you will, custodians of uh, some of the uh, most, uh, uh, most uh, sought after endemic species uh, for uh, sea life and uh, plant life. So yes, that is in place. Minister, thank you. Minister Ang, you've already told us you had a responsible tourism policy before you actually put in your strategy. I already explained to the audience about all the policy, responsible tourism policy, do's and don'ts also, the, the, the very helpful uh, information with cartoons and also the community involve, involvement in tourism and the final draft of the Myanmar Tourism Master Plan. We already included to preserve our nat natural and cultural heritage. That's why today we are discussing on sustainable tourism development, which means we have to care about our products. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think we, we are thinking through how to implement uh, what's on paper, you know, not allowed and all that about sustainable uh, tourism in the environmental sense. And I think to be practical at the end of the day, how do you uh, have the right incentive where uh, you can have economic development and sustainability? Uh, we'll, can, I can give you examples where we've, what we're trying to do, for instance, waste. Uh, collecting plastic and recycling it. You have to put a monet, uh, monetize it, uh, and then, then you can get uh, things going, even though you do have to have a lot of education uh, to the people in the tourism area. Uh, and uh, I think uh, dynamite fishing is, is a big problem for, for, I'm sure, also in the Philippines. So I, I think your Borokai in initiative is, is, really, is really a good idea. So how do you change the fishermen from wanting to catch fish with using dynamite to wanting to protect it? You know, you have to give them alternative livelihoods, you have to, et cetera. So I think, I think that's the way we want to approach it, and hopefully uh, we wish us luck because it is a lot of coordination mm -hmm. uh, with stakeholders, with uh, NGOs, as well as with local government. Uh, and especially in the in the ocean, it's really difficult to monitor because you know you're talking about wide expanse of uh, sea where uh, if you don't have the patrol boats, what are you going to do? You know. I can't take it. So I have to give uh, oh, yeah. Sebastian. Yes, if yes. you have any one last thirty second comment, Tony, I'll come to you at the end. Sorry, Excellency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it's. Um, it, we need to keep in mind that we are invited in people's homes and we're suddenly barging inside their, their living rooms, inside their kitchen, we're opening their fridges and taking things. When we're investors, when we are, uh, we, we just come in and we need to do this very carefully, very mindfully. We need to be respectful and extremely careful how we do this because we, we, we take things for granted and I think the conversation where only big business and government happen, have the conversation is, is dangerous. You have to have the local businesses, you have to have the communities, you have to have the civil societies and uh, the teaching institutions. You need to have also the visitors involved. Everyone must be part of this conversation and cannot be 
just business and government making decisions because we are living and working and, and enjoying other people's homes. Thank you. And I want one last comment, if you will, from you, Tony. Uh, just um, build a brand, keep it simple. And I love the minister's comment, actually, that Myanmar is a big country. So the areas that we, you can be uh, brave on, the other areas you can say, well, let's keep tourists away from that but let's not get too hooked up on sustainability in the whole country and uh, avoid giving people a chance to uh, grow economically. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just give you half a dozen takeaway points that I've picked up from this. <laughs> <laughs> I finish now. <laughs> One, fly air Asia. How is that, okay? <laughs> One, whole of government. Two, inclusion of everyone at the start. It's a population issue, it's not just a sectoral issue. You need a good strategy. Green has to be there at the same time as growth. Implementation is where it's all going to be at. There's plenty of papers floating about now. The question is, how is it going to be implemented? That's going to need a lot of money, a lot of innovative financing. Open skies, Smart borders, easy visas, keep the costs down, don't go crazy on taxation, tax wisely, get your branding right because brand is critically important, education, formal and bringing young people more and more into play. We live in our towers and the forum shows how the benefits are of bringing the young people. Last point. This isn't an issue of we come here, we have a meeting, and we say we can solve the problems. Some of these issues, the environment, the carbon, this is a 20-year game. The key is to be moving in the right direction together. I'd like to thank the panel, thank the audience, if you'd like to thank them in the traditional way. <laughs>